It's my privilege to introduce our guest today, Ann Apking and Kathy Glenn. I've known Ann through her work with ISPI. I wanted to attend her session on e-learning last year, but it conflicted with the session I was presenting. So I approached Ann to host a webinar for us. She recommended bringing in Kathy to provide a unique insight into a long-standing and successful consultant-client relationship. Fortunately for all of us, Kathy agreed. <laughs> During their time with us today, Ann and Kathy will discuss how they work together, share lessons learned, answer your questions. As part of this conversation, they'll also describe how they use prototyping and usability testing. Ann and Kathy, we're delighted to have you with us today. Well, thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. We're, we're uh, really happy that uh, that you invited us. Um, uh, I'll start. I'll start by, you know, uh, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Ann Atkins. And first, Steve, before I give a little background on who I am, you all should know that Steve didn't really approach me at the ISPI conference. He stalked and ambushed me <laughs> at the ISPI conference and wouldn't let me out of the ballroom until I said yes. So just wanted to set the, the, the record straight there, Steve. But uh, in any case, um, I have been um, in this field for 30 years or so. Um, you know, uh, the last, um, gosh, 10 10, 11 years, 12 years, have been on my own. Previously to that, I was um, a part of a, um, a couple of different training and performance consulting firms. Um, so long, you know, always in a consulting role, external consulting role, never working inside an organization like Kathy does here at Steelcase. Um, so my perspective has really been born out of, of uh, sort of being an outsider looking in to an organization. Um, um, a lot of the projects I've done, um, gosh, over the past, um, uh, how long have we been working together? Fifteen, 15 years. Yeah. Fifteen years or so. Um, actually, actually more than that. I think my first project here, and we'll get into a slide that shows this, was uh, back in 1988. So do the math, I guess. It's been a lot longer than 15 years. But um, uh, Kathy and I, so Kathy and I go way back. Kathy. So I'm Kathy Glenn, and as Ann said, um, I'm a performance consultant at um, Steelcase. And Steelcase is a, um, a, a global manufacturer of office environments. Um, our headquarters is based in Grand Rapids, but we um, have manufacturing, sales offices, and um, um, other offices throughout, um, throughout the world. Um, so my perspective is um, a little different than Anne's. Um, I have clients, but they are internal clients. And so as a performance co consultant, I not only work with um, external performance consultants like Anne, but I have internal clients as well. I spent probably half of my career here at Steelcase in some capacity of um, learning and development. So with that, um, let's just review uh, what Ann and I would like to cover in today's session. Um, first, we just want to compare and contrast um, learning and performance improvement professionals, our point of view from inside and outside the organization, describe how we work together, so what are our roles, responsibilities, expectations um, as an internal um, performance consultant and external performance consultant, we want to review a project with you that we've um, recently completed and walk you through the process that we used for that project and um, share some secrets of our success and then um, answer any questions that you have. And I think um, Steve had mentioned um, as part of the introduction, um, we want this to be informal. We want it to be conversation, not presentation. So if at any time you do have a question, as Steve was saying, please use the chat box and, um, and we will answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Anne. Does that sound like a good approach to folks? I mean, I'm not seeing anything in the meeting chat, but truly, if, if I mean, Kathy and I are, are at a point in our relationship that um, if, if one of us has a thought, the other one can generally finish the sentence. So, um, we may we may 
you know, sort of skim over something that you guys would find really pertinent. So we really do want you to use the meeting chat. Um, so as we mentioned, I mean, we go we go way back. I um, um, was a part of a uh, uh, training and performance consulting firm called Triad Performance Technologies, and at our largest, we were about 85 consultants. Um, located in Michigan, Ohio, and Minnesota. Um, we began that organization in 1988 and closed it in 20, uh, 2004. Um, so my relationship with Steelcase, and, and it w really began with uh, being a performance co consultant at Triad. Um, the very, very first project Triad was awarded. I mean, when we were a, a band of five people, <laughs> was a, a project with uh, Steelcase called the Quality Alliance. And that was back in 1988 and really got fired up in 1989 and proceeded from there. It was, it was your basic um, service quality improvement initiative that was really popular in the early 90s. And that was uh, bread and butter for Triad in the first couple of years we got started and really, really helped us launch our consulting firm. And then from there, we just started rolling on with projects um, um, you know, as as time went on, Pathways was a project. Pathways was a really a, a product portfolio that that Steelcase was launching to get. Gosh, and Kathy, you may be better able to articulate this than me, but um, more than than uh, desks and work surfaces and chairs and storage, um, Pathways was Steelcase's opportunity and and. Um, um, the, their inspiration to try and get into the, the you know, construction of workspace from the exterior walls in, yeah. not just, you know, so flooring, lighting, walls, you know, HV, I mean, everything that goes within a, a workspace, um, DOKs could handle. And so that was a huge, huge initiative that, uh, that we worked on together for a number of years. And as part of that, we did something called Construction Zone, which we were just revisiting over lunch today. Um, that was a very specific project, but it was truly one of the first really innovative and creative um, um, learning initiatives that we undertook together. Um, it involved 500 people in a ballroom um, in an evening. So you can kind of imagine, you know, needing to put on your sort of your innovation hat and, and come up with ways to engage people um, you know, for an evening of learning. Um, you know, from there, there were a number of projects. One was global onboarding, um, trying to, to make consistent the onboarding process across the globe for steel case, for new steel case employees. Um, another one, um, and this is one we're going to dive into a little bit today, um, teaching folks here at steel case how to think critically about big business challenges and issues. And there are two, two initiatives within this project right now, think and plan to implement. And we're going to present a little bit of that to you um, today. And in fact, that's still an ongoing project mm -hmm. that, in fact, Kathy and I probably need to talk about the next step of the critical thinking model, yes. you know, here soon in the fall. And right now, in fact, today, I'm here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, with Kathy and the team and we are designing the third workshop in a series of three workshops to help new people leaders influence the culture uh, within where they, within the, the place that they work. And so it's, it's very um, sort of wispy and, and sort of conceptual uh, work we're doing here today, but it, we, you know, we've got a workshop and we know we have two days, and so we're gonna design that workshop experience here, um, we started it this morning, we'll continue our work this afternoon and in the weeks to come. So this engage this this relationship has spanned a lot of projects and a lot of years. Yep. I would agree. So this slide shows how we work together. So I'm kind of on the left side, Kathy's kind of on the right side. It's sort of this outside in, inside out kind of look. But if you look at this this table, you will see that we we're very complementary in our roles, I think. Um, I, in fact, even at, at the ISPI conference um, in April this year, I called myself a learning experience architect. Um, more than an instructional designer, 
I, I design learning experiences that are memorable and sticky. I want to, I want to fundamentally change folks um, through the learning that they experience. And there, there's a lot that goes into that, but that, that is, I think, um, as I've gotten this far in my career, that's how I really think about the work that I do. And I, so I think what, um, uh, what complements Anne so well um, with Steelcase's learning and development group is that that's where we desire to go um, with our learning solutions as well. We are, we are moving more from learning as an event to um, learning as an experience that happens over time. Um, we're looking for behavior change in our employees. Um, it's, we often tell employees it's not enough just to go to the training event. That is just the beginning. It's how you use what you've learned um, in the workshop or whatever that um, learning experience is. It's how you use that back on the job that will um, change performance and change behavior over the time. So um, in the um, first row here, Ann has... Um, you know, thinks of herself as the learning experience architect. Um, I think in the relationship that Ann and I have, um, I would be thought of as the thought leader, as, as Ann has titled it. So it's my responsibility when I work with Ann to represent um, the organization as best I can, represent what we're trying to accomplish with this um, learning intervention, this learning solution, represent um, perhaps the business result that we're after, the performance change we're after, or the behavior change that we're after. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. again, it's my job to um, represent that and communicate that to Anne. Mm -hmm. And then with regard to a particular initiative, um, I think they look to me for ideas as a designer, um, but at the end of the day, it's also my job to write it down. I've got it, I, I would be the one to craft the design document to craft um, whatever learning materials we need, um, whatever tools, job aids, reference, or may maybe it's process documentation, maybe it's something else, but it would be my job to, to you know, own, own, the, own the, the capturing and, and, and solidification of that, of all that thinking. Right. And so as the, as the primary contact for Anne, um, I'm responsible for making sure the initiative um, is moving along at the right pace, that we're meeting the, the deadlines and the milestones that we've set, that we're good stewards of the um, company's resources in terms of budget and people. I would also um, say that um, this is very much a collaborative effort, um, whatever Ann and I work on together. So it, it's not just me sitting in a room and, and dumping my brain to Ann and then she goes away and does something and comes back. We could, as we're doing today, spend a day together um, whiteboarding our thoughts, brainstorming what we want this learning solution to be, thinking about who the target audience is, and, um, and sort of what is their life like, what is their day like. So we're, we're very much trying to um, get into the minds of our learner and, um, and, and really have empathy for that individual in terms of what is it they need to be successful in, in their jobs and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. The next three lines, I think, of this table are, it's interesting that it's basically the same. Mm -hmm. Kathy and I, you know, once they, once they identify a need and they need to bring me on board, they need, you know, an extra pair of hands and another brain to help them think through something, she and I really work I mean, if you looked at what we're doing, you wouldn't be able to tell who works here at Steelcase and who's an external consultant. What we're doing is, is the same. Um, and I also, I put the word research in there, and I think that it's, it's notable um, to mention that not on every project do you have subject matter experts who are able to spoon up all the content and information you need. Sometimes you have to go find it. Sometimes you have to dig for it. And sometimes you have to make it up, I guess. I mean, it's just, and so um, the project that we're going to talk to you today about um, with regard to the critical thinking model, there was no expertise, really. There was very little, I should say. There were some. But there was, we had to do a lot more outside digging than I have ever done on a project before. And Kathy and I would divvy that up and, and worked on it together, learned about it, 
digested it together, and figured out how to leverage what we learned um, to the benefit of Steelcase. Um, so research, analyze, design, prototyping, and testing. I mean, we were partners in crime on all of that. Um, we both function as facilitators on the, on the, the, the learning that we develop. Um, but the, there's a big reach here. I mean, Steelcase is a global organization, and she and I can't be everywhere. So we have had to, to um, uh, build you know, a, a, little, a small army of facilitators, and Kathy, that's really your job. Right, right. So as Ann was saying, because we are a global organization, um, and we do not have, um, within our corporate learning and development team, we have a few um, dedicated resources for facilitators, but we don't have, um, a, a, I would say, a staff or a department of facilitators. So often, um, what Ann and I find ourselves doing on initiatives that we're working on is um, recruiting facilitators um, from the employee population within our own organization. And in the um, initiative that we're going to share with you, there was um, real intentionality around thinking about who we want facilitating um, our workshops and our learning interventions. And um, part of the direction that we're headed in as a learning and development group is there's no better way to um, embed the skill or the behavior change that you want in your organization than to have your own employees facilitating the learning for you. And so part of what I do on the initiatives that I work on is um, recruit and train um, employees to be facilitators within the organization. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, you know, you know, implementation and evaluation, as they start rolling into implementation, especially when it goes global, and we have our facilitators, um, we have a staff of folks we can rely on. Kathy kind of takes it over at that point, and I start to inch my way out. Um, I'll always, if I can, and they need me to, jump in as a facilitator, um, which I do on occasion. Um, but at this point, we've got a, you know, really a pretty good staff of folks out there who you know, are skilled and really get it, which is, which is amazing, and globally, yeah, which is very yeah. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> But I would, I would say the other thing that we um, often rely on you for, Anne, is um, revising. So, oh, yep. you know, even though we, we may have um, a learning intervention in place, um, we, we try to be very um, intentional about keeping those materials current. And, um, and so we may call Anne back into the project again a year or two after implementation to help us take a look at um, the content and based on what we've learned about um, facilitating a certain workshop over um, a period of time, we may need to make changes to the workshop and Anne has helped us with that as well. Yeah. Okay. Should we go on to the Yeah, I think we'll go on. I'm not seeing anything in the meeting chat. I, I guess, you know, so far we're 100% clear and, and <laughs> it, maybe nothing's a big surprise at this point. Um, so. So I think the project that we, we really want to share with you is um, it, it's a project called Think. And it really comes from a um, critical thinking model that our CEO put in front of the organization probably seven years ago. And it looks, as you can see from the graphic here, it looks like a fairly straightforward thinking process. First you think, then you develop a point of view, then you plan your implementation, and then you implement. So fairly straightforward. However, um, what we were finding as an organization is that um, we would do a little bit of thinking, and then we would jump to implementation, uh, or do a little bit of thinking, come to a very um, quick point of view, a little bit of planning, but we were very um, heavily weighted towards implementation. And so this um, model was put forth by the CEO as a way to um, intentionally slow us down as an organization and to think more deeply. It also came at a time in the organization when um, we were feeling um, growing pains in terms of becoming more of a globally integrated organization. Um, and we were um, beginning to 
um, experience what we would call uh, complex wicked problems as a result of being a globally integrated organization. And so the CEO came to the learning and development group and said, I need your help in um, really uh, not just training the organization, but embedding behaviors in the organization to get people to think more deeply. We all think, but his desire was that we think more deeply his desire um, in our vision is for Steelcase to be an innovative um, organization, and the only way you get innovation is to do some very critical deep thinking. And his desire was for um, not just our product development groups or our research groups to be thinking deeply, but all parts of the organization. And so there is a, um, a think model, which I've just put up on the screen, um, that again looks fairly straightforward, but this is where we brought Anne into the project and said, um, okay, <laughs> we have this framework here for thinking, um, but how do we teach people this? What behaviors are we trying to um, drive in the organization? We know we want to be innovative, but what, is, what else is there beyond that? And so, as Anne was saying, um, we really had to do some pretty deep research in terms of um, what does this look like? Um, what should it be for the organization? Is there, mm -hmm. is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I'm going to go into the next there. Um, with regard to, just so you get a, a, a general sense of, of how somebody might apply this this think framework. Um, typically a team would be posed a central question by a leader in their organization. And it would tip it shouldn't be um, either a yes or no question. It shouldn't and it shouldn't be something that you could answer top of mind. This is these are typically chronic problems that play a part of the organization that have have um, not been solved by previous, you know, potential solutions or, or initiatives. So it's a central question. It's a wicked business issue, and a team would form around this central question, and they would start in the lower left corner by doing some deep research, um, spread, you know, casting the net war, wide and far, and and doing deep research around all aspects of that issue. They would come together as a group to analyze, and we presented them numerous um, tools, just as we did in research. We presented numerous tools for how you might go about researching. We gave them numerous tools for how to analyze the data that they collect, sort it, and group it so that in synthesize, they could gain some true insight around that central question. And then as they, they have, as they, they glean their insights, they are able to to, as a team then move into realize where they can prototype a solution. So it looks like we've got a couple of questions that have come in on the chat that we'll try to answer. The first one is, what techniques do you now embed in your training as part of SYNC to support transfer in the workplace and behavior change in the job? So um, there are a couple of things that we, um, that we do beyond the workshop. So this SYNC workshop that Ann and I are describing um, is a three-day workshop that um, we, again, facilitate globally. So um, one of the things that we have provided for participants after they leave the workshop is a, um, a resource site that we call the Think Tank. And um, the Think Tank is a website, an internal website, that employees can go to to get access to all the tools and templates that we um, taught and used in the workshop. So that's one way that we provide performance support. Another way that we provide performance support is really through our facilitators. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that um, our facilitators for this workshop are employees. And one of the great things about using employees as your facilitators is they become your early adopters. Mm -hmm. They become your advocates. Um, they become the coaches in their part of the organization. 
And, um, and that is what we have seen happen with our facilitators. They're coaches, they're advocates. They're out helping teams that are trying to solve what Anne described as these wicked problems. I would say the third thing in terms of performance support is um, uh, senior leader expectation. It is the expectation of every senior leader in the organization that when people are assigned um, projects that they use this methodology. And so when employees go before senior leaders, um, senior leaders will ask them, what is your central question? What deep research did you do? What insights did you derive? How did you come at your point of view? So there is, um, our senior leaders are modeling the behavior that we desire the rest of the organization to have. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's another question here. Can you provide examples of some of the wicked problems that Think has addressed? Oh my gosh. Um, we use this framework for um, product development. So if we are, um, if we have identified a new opportunity in the marketplace, we will use it for something as big as what really is our, our mar market opportunity um, in perhaps the education market, for example, mm -hmm. or in the healthcare market. Um, uh, higher ed market. Um, we, we've, so we've used it in, for big initiatives like that, but we've also used it for um, initiatives that um, right now I'm working with a team um, that's trying to better understand um, what do our salespeople need in terms of um, product knowledge. And so we have used this framework to form our central question in terms of um, what product knowledge do our salespeople need? How, how do they use that product knowledge? Um, are there differences in the knowledge that they need based on the roles that they have in the organization? So again, this framework has really, over the last four years, become um, a part of who we are as an organization and how we solve problems. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to, no one asked a question about this in particular, but one thing I want to add about this uh, Think Workshop in particular is um, this, this particular initiative was probably the most, um, we took a big risk, I should say, with this, with this particular workshop. I had suggested, I mean, one of the key things for me uh, for this initiative was, you know, how, how do you actually get people to practice? I mean, where we, present, we present a lot of tools and methods for researching, analyzing, synthesizing, you know, gaining insights and such. Um, but how do you get people to practice? Well, we had this opportunity with a three-day face-to-face, and I suggested that we leverage, I don't know, 60 or 70 percent of the time for the audience to engage in a case study. And I suggested during this design, just like we're doing today, that we create a case study, but it not be steel case based, that it be an, a different organization altogether. And we bannered about a couple, and one of the recommendations that I put forth was, what about if we base the case study on the US Postal Service? There is an organization that is clearly struggling right now, um, you know, frankly, with their reason for being, you know, who uses snail mail anymore? I mean, as technology becomes more ubiquitous in all aspects of our life, the U.S. Postal Service becomes less and less relevant. And so we put, and what I loved about the U.S. Postal Service is that it's a real organization, that you can do tons of research on the U.S. Postal Service right at your fingertips. You can go and do external research. You can go and you can go to the post office and observe. You can you have your own personal experience with it. You get your mail every day. So we decided to actually craft a case study and insofar as one of the two facilitators that facilitates every single think workshop actually role plays the role of the postmaster general. And so in, in our Train the Trainer, we, we map that out for folks. And if you're going to be the Postmaster General, there's a lot of research you need to do on the Postal Service. And we also were able to make that 
we were able to broaden it so that it became global because every country has their own postal service, how, whatever the nature is, and we were able to spin this case study so that it worked globally. <laughs> oh, there's, another, there's another question in the chat. Um, is the Think Workshop proprietary is available uh, to, to us outsiders? Unfortunately, we've had this question before, and we've run it past our legal team, and it is proprietary. Um, we are not allowed to uh, monetize this workshop outside of Steelcase, but we, we very much understand that we have something extremely unique here. But I would also say that there are um, some uh, there are some organizations mm -hmm. out there that can help your organization become more critical thinkers. Um, I, I'm thinking specifically of um, the Stanford D School. They have a wonderful, they, they will call it design thinking, but it's, um, it, it, it is a unique way of problem solving um, that we are approaching as well. In fact, we have a um, great partnership with um, Stanford University. You can go online and, and take um, one of, I probably shouldn't be saying this. <laughs> they, they have online courses that you can take that will um, teach a methodology similar to what we're teaching within our own organization. So, um, so there are resources that are available to help you um, grow this type of thinking in your organization. Yeah. Um, do we have virtual facilitators? You know, it's interesting because we've been asked if, if we would ever teach this workshop virtually, and we have made a conscious decision not to. Um, we know it would be a lot easier for me to not have to travel um, to Malaysia or to France or Germany or wherever to facilitate this workshop. We do have facilitators globally, um, so the, the amount of travel that has to be done is, is minimal, but because this is such a hands-on workshop, We've made, um, again, the decision that um, we would not do this in a virtual format. Um, what's this? We're using the Stanford's... Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. yes. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the, um, the boot camp bootleg. That's awesome. That's great. Good deal. And, and just to just close out this, this, this um, big initiative, if you will, of, of the critical thinking model, which is... The, the linear line, think, point of view, plan, implement, implement. Just so that you get a sort of a sense of where we're at here, we developed and launched Think four years ago? Yeah, four years ago. And then two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Two years ago, Think and point of view are taught as one workshop of, of the critical thinking model. So at the end of Think, you actually arrive at a point of view. And we actually have a tool, a set of tools that help you position your point of view to your leadership and such so that you can get buy-in and, and um, be able to push your solution forward. Um, two years ago, Kathy and I worked on plan to implement and in fact had many of, of uh, the tools and uh, the ideas that we have garnered in our research around design thinking are embedded in plan to implement. Um, that particular workshop, I is absolutely ripe for anybody who's trying to to have better ideas, who have innovations and they want to to move those innovations and, and take them forward. And to me, a learning initiative is an innovation. It's a solution. It's something you can craft and put out there. So um, in Plan to Implement, um, we teach folks a lot about prototyping and um, user testing, customer appropriation, that kind of thing. So that workshop's been out there for two years. Um, at some point in the near future, I have a feeling we're going to be working on Implement together. Absolutely. We haven't started that yet. Nope. I'm thinking that Kathy's doing some initial research and some, some um, uh, initial thinking around Implement, but that will be yet to come. And, and once we put that on... The end cap yeah. I think we'll have all of the critical thinking right. model um, accomplished. So Nathan asked a question um, earlier. We made reference to project milestones. How do we identify these key progress indicators? Oh. And I think that might be on the, um, the next slide. So yeah. um, thank you, Nathan. That was a great <laughs> segue for us into the next slide. So 
Um, we're going to kind of walk you through what our typical approach is um, when we do this sort of work that I think will help you identify what some of those milestones are. So I'm going to just kind of share these first um, three boxes because um, these are probably uh, more in my area of responsibility than Anne's area of responsibility. So um, for me, uh, a need is identified at Steelcase. And um, somebody within the organization will um, come to the learning and development group and say, I need this for my um, employees, or I have this initiative going on where we um, need some learning intervention. And so um, that person that we call a stakeholder contacts us um, in learning and development. SCU um, means Steelcase University, which is um, another way that we um, think and look at ourselves in the learning and development group. So we consider the need um, and what their, um, what our internal uh, talent and workload is. So. One of the determinations that we have to make internally is that is this a request that um, we have capacity to handle within our own team, or is this a request that we need to bring in um, a vendor partner for? So um, that determination is made. If the determination is made that we need to bring in um, our vendor partner, then that's when um, I would give Anne a call um, and start sort of explaining to her and talking a little bit about um, the background and the history, um, what we're trying to accomplish with this um, particular request. Yep. So I'll take the next row here. This yep. is kind of where I walk in the door. Um, typically I'll come in and there will be probably more than Kathy actually. Typically there's, there's a handful of people that, that, that either share some sort of expertise around the need um, or they're a stakeholder in the, in the need and they just want to be there for an initial download to me in terms of what, what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, that could be one meeting, that could be numerous meetings. It, it, probably the, if, if we're having numerous meetings, it's because the need is a big, hairy, audacious problem or th it, it's it, the need is, is fairly, you know, the solution is going to be fairly big and broad. I mean, I remember we actually in sync went at this a couple, yeah. three times before we actually started wrapping our heads around what we really wanted yeah. to do. But once we start to get our thinking aligned around what what a potential solution might look like, um, and this is, this will probably happen at the, at the end of today, I'll craft an initial design concept, something I might call a napkin pitch. Um, as we conduct design meetings. Now, um, for example, today we know that we're going to craft a two-day workshop as a third in a series of, of workshops for people leaders around culture. And right now, if you were in the room with us here, you would see that we have a big old whiteboard and we're blocking out the two days and how we might invest those. And we're going to move that stuff around and we're going to, you know, it's going to evolve, but initial thinking could be documented somewhat as a napkin pitch, kind of a sort of a high-level illustration. Um, this is what we're thinking, and it's sort of down and dirty. You just get it out there, and you start iterating your thinking with that very, very first approach. Um, we'll cycle around on that, building out the napkin pitch into something that's a little bit more detailed, a detailed design document, perhaps, um, that outlines the instructional strategies, the learning objectives, um, or the performance objectives, um, how we're going to leverage our time, what materials are we going to need to build, all that sort of thing. And so we, we take, we, I mean, basically what we're doing is we're just trying to make sense of our thinking and um, um, evolve a solution out of that so that we're all on the same page by the time we actually start developing materials. Okay. So, um I'm going to take the next row here, but before I, I get into some of the items here, um, I want to go back to um, one of the things that Ann said about conducting the initial meeting to download the need and, and references. Um, one of the, from my perspective, one of the great things about working with Ann and the fact that she had mentioned she's got 15 or 20 years history with working with Steelcase, 
that um, she understands our organization. She understands our culture. She understands the business we're in. So oftentimes there's not a whole lot of explaining of things that I need to do with her. Um, I can simply um, uh, describe the initiative to her and um, mentally she is right there with me because she has all of this great um, working history with us. In fact, I said to Anne that there are times when I forget that she is um, an outside consultant and I begin to say things assuming that she understands everything that I am talking about. And most of the time she does. But again, when you have this great um, history um, with your partner, things can move faster. Um, is there a question? Yeah, a couple of questions here. Okay. I, I'm, it says, what does a typical design document contain? Um, well, I, I did rattle off a, uh, a number of those things. I mean, a, a typical design document um, would likely have, you know, probably a page or so that, that position the initiative with regard to the need and where in the organization it's occurring, that kind of thing. So there's typically sort of a situational review, that kind of thing. Um, a high-level description of the solution, um, learning or performance objectives, you know, description of the target audience, that kind of thing. But the main body, for me anyway, of the design document is sort of a, a, a blueprint um, of the, arch you know, the architecture, the learning architecture of that solution. So what is that experience going to look like? to um, someone who's, att who's attending or engaging in that learning solution. Um, how is their time leverage? How are we paying off those, those objectives? Um, if, if there's a, we can go into more detail if there's another um, question about that, but maybe, maybe we should forge ahead. I think. Yeah, there's another question about how much prototyping occurs before the detailed design document in the development phase. Um, I would say prototyping doesn't occur before the, the design document. The design document is simply um, a piece of paper. And, um, but what we will do is um, we will take what's on that paper and we might prototype one or two things before we start developing the entire um, learning experience. And, and we will prototype those um, few key things with um, users with people that would actually be attending this workshop or this um, um, learning intervention that we're designing. Um, so the, the next rows here is, um, I think as Ann was saying, we, we just follow this iterative process of developing and reviewing and revising. Um, I have to have periodic check-ins with my um, key leaders and stakeholders so that they are um, aware of what we're doing. Um, and then we already talked a little bit about conducting these user tests and customer co-creation sessions with our prototypes. So um, when we talk about prototypes, we are talking about user tests. We're talking about customer co-creation sessions where you are actually getting real-time input from employees, from learners, from those users that are going to be engaging with your solution. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like there's another question here. So the detailed design document is a macro level architecture with prototyping occurring and user testing for key components of the architecture. Yeah, I would say, I mean... Pretty organic. <laughs> yeah, um, macro level, I mean, the, the design document can get fair, I mean, pretty detailed. I don't know what you really mean by macro. Um, and it, in this case, with regard to think, we're talking about one workshop. This isn't a curriculum architecture where we're talking about, um, for example, all of product knowledge and how are we, you know, what, you know, what, which courses, are, you know, how are we, what are we going to teach via e-learning versus what are we going to teach face to face? What's going to be, you know, um, reference driven or you know, performance support? I mean, this is this is a in this case in this example a design document that outlines one three day learning process with some. Uh, pre-work that happens before and, and, and some follow-up. So, but, the, but Kathy said it, I think the prototyping occurs after we craft the design document and we typically prototype components of a solution where we, we feel um, they, there might be some risk. Um, in fact, we did, we were uncertain about whether or not creating a big, 
huge case study on the U.S. Postal Service was the right thing to do. In fact, we thought we might get pushback from folks. Why are you wasting you know, the better part of three days of our time working on in this issue for the U.S. Postal Service when we could be solving one of steel cases problems? And so we prototyped that case study. I kind of really, really bare bones. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. But, and we tested it with some folks to see if there was an appetite and a tolerance for that kind of a case study. And we found that, in fact, there was. And, in fact, they were refreshed that they weren't working. There's, there's a lot of baggage that comes with presenting a problem or a case study that's born out of the organization. People can have a history with stuff like that, and they have their own baggage with it. And it's better to not bring that into the into the learning. It's better to just start fresh with a, with on neutral ground. Mm -hmm. And that's what I felt like we did with the USPS. So there's another question here. So is the iterative process prototyping user test detailed design document? The um, actually the iterative process. The iterative process is all around prototyping, and there are different ways to prototype. You could prototype doing a user test, which means you just bring people into a room and, um, and you throw out a concept to them, and they react to it. Or you can prototype um, using customer co-creation, which is sort of what Anne described around this case study. We brought people in, and we actually immersed them in the case study to see um, how does this work for them? Um, the, the user tests are more around, do people like the concept? Do they like the idea? Customer co-creation is, is it, is it going to work? So that is, and then in terms of the detailed design document, it's sort of interesting because I think the design document and iterating on that depends on the client that you're working with and the mm -hmm. level of trust that there is between the internal um, performance consultant and the external performance consultant. Um, if you're working with a new client or um, if I was working with a new vendor, I, I may want more iterations of a design document just to assure me that uh, my um, external partner is tracking with where I want to go with this solution. But because Ann and I have worked so closely together over the last 10 years or so, I trust that she, when I say something, she knows exactly what I mean and I know she'll deliver on what I'm imagining. Um, so in our case, we did one design document mm -hmm. and left it at that, knowing that we would learn more as we iterated on our prototype. Yeah. And I can tell you from years of experience, I almost never develop exactly what I designed in my design doc. There's always some learning. You, you get smarter as you go. You learn more as you go. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's okay if you deviate from that, as long as everybody's, you know, um, on board with that. Yeah. So in this last row, I mean, we would typically conduct one or more pilot tests. Um, obviously, you want to try the whole thing out before you go live with it and you, you, you know, train a lot of facilitators, perhaps, to, to teach it. Um, I mean, and then these next couple, but this is kind of where I pass the baton kind of to Kathy in terms of planning the implementation and the rollout or the on-ramp. How, you know, how is this learning solution going to become part of the, the, the learning framework for the organization? How are people going to know about it? How are people going to get excited about it? Um, how do you create an appetite for it in the organization? I mean, with Think, it was really kind of an interesting thing. We did no sort of marketing or, or communication around think at all. It was kind of like, um, if you build it, they will come, and they did. Mm -hmm. And, oh, my gosh, I mean, in fact, we were kind of overwhelmed with the response. We could not initially keep up with all of the implementations of, I mean, people want, people were blowing up the LMS trying to register for that thing, and we couldn't didn't have enough facilitators to teach it. So all of us were teaching it a bunch of times just to try to, get people, and then as soon as people would go back to their organizations, more people wanted to attend. So it was a really, a really great problem to have. It was. Um, but Kathy really manages sort of the back end of, of, all, of, of all of that. Right. So I, I sort of want to just very quickly circle back to the question about milestone date. So for me as the internal performance consultant, um, when, um, when we put a project plan together, we put a schedule together with that, and some key milestone dates in my mind, would be um, the design document. Mm -hmm. um, that is a key milestone that tells you 
When you sign off on that design document, you are saying, yes, we are ready to move into development. Um, so I would say another key milestone would be around um, uh, the pilot. So if, if we're piloting this workshop, that means that um, we are very confident that we have um, iterated on this, we have tested it, and we are ready to pilot the full-blown workshop, not just parts and pieces, but we're ready to um, pilot the full-blown workshop um, with a, um, a, a target group. The, the other milestone date for, for uh, me, again, as the internal performance consultant, is um, implementation. When are we in full-blown implementation? Because that, that's a handoff for me internally to another um, group in the organization. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to just jump in on milestones and take that from an external point of view. Um, I mean, if some of you out there are, are thinking about being, you know, being a single shingle, you know, being an external consultant, um, trying to win your own, con you know, your own clients and, and your own projects, the way I think about this work, when Kathy calls me and says, hey, Ann, I think I have a, a, a need in the organization that is right up your alley that you would be really good for, um, that initial work, in fact, what's represented in the second row of this graphic, for me, would be um, an un sort of an upfront research um, and design phase. And typically, I would... Um, contract with Kathy and with Steelcase on just the cost for me to be involved from the kickoff through a detailed design doc. I don't typically start, you know, walk in the door and try to estimate the level of effort it's going to take for me to get all the way through the, the last box on this graphic right from the get-go. That's crazy because I don't know what the solution is. So I'll typically contract just for research and design. And the milestone there would be the acceptance of a detailed design doc. Then once everybody says, yes, this is what we want to develop, then I will create a second contract or a second agreement for my role in developing and testing and supporting um, a T3, for example, or implementation if I'm actually going to facilitate. And then I'll estimate that. So it's kind of a two-phase um, contracting agreement. So those, I think about those milestones with regard to financial agreements as well. So let's move on to um, the secrets of our success. Um, you know, I think uh, first and foremost, um, Steelcase is a very relationship-oriented organization. And, um, and that's what we look for in our vendor partners as well. We are not looking for transactional vendor partners. We're looking for um, vendor partners that we can form long-term relationships with. Um, and I believe that um, that's what we have found with, with Anne. You know, and from my point of view, I mean, I want to do, do meaningful work that makes a difference to the organization. I don't want to be involved in a project that is simply the cranking out of a bunch of deliverables, a bunch of materials. Um, I mean, I love to work with smart people who, you know, who care as much about the effort as I do and that are willing to sort of think outside the box, um, be creative in the learning design, and try new things. And I mean, for me, that's what I have found here at Steelcase. So we're going to share with you some of our, based on that, what are our secrets to success. And I think um, we both sort of said it, the first bullet point here, we really do have a true partnership of collaboration and trust. And you cannot underestimate that word trust. Um, trust allows us to move fast. Mm -hmm. I think trust allows us to take shortcuts mm -hmm. where we wouldn't be able to take shortcuts. So, and, and then the notion of collaboration, it, it really is Ann and I getting in a room together and um, sort of uh, cranking through things. Yep. I think there's, I mean, I think this presentation showed we have, you know, a, a very deep and shared history of experiences. I mean, over lunch we were, we were joking about construction zone and pathways and, you know, the successes and failures of those things. And I mean, all of those things add color to a shared backdrop that we have. And, and I can't tell you how often 
little pieces and parts of past projects come to bear on something we're working on today. I mean, it's just it, it just gives you such a sort of a rich scrapbook to work with. Mm -hmm. I think this next one, um, uh, this notion that Anne really does have a deep understanding of Steelcase in our culture. And, um, and it's really, for me, as the internal performance consultant, it is important that the vendor partners I work with understand our culture because um, culture plays a big part in how things happen in an organization, how behaviors get changed and shaped in an organization, um, what the barriers might be to that. And that all plays into how you design and develop um, your learning intervention. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think um, one thing I've seen over the years, and this was true early on, but it has just been reinforced repeatedly over the years, is that our values around how adults learn, how you affect performance, the whole philosophy about how you can influence that. We share a common um, value system. Um, I am not treated like a vendor dog here. I'm not, you know, I don't get um, you know, thrown under the bus here. You know, I'm not the dog that they kick when, you know, I mean, it, that happens more than, unfortunately, more than it ought to. And, you know, I've seen it with other clients. That is not the case here. We, we share, we share value, a, a same, the same value system with regard to our craft. And we sort of share the same, um, we're, we're, we're all after the same thing here, which is, which is in value. And then this um, bullet point here, ownership and passion for the effort. I, I hope you got a sense of that um, as Ann and I were um, sharing with you our, our journey with this THINK workshop. We both have a passion for what we do. Yep. And then this last one, um, I, I think it, what's, what's interesting is we're both sort of strategic thinkers and we can be ca tactical. We can think strategically about the initiative but at the end of the day, we got to get something done. So we can both be dreamers, and we can both be doers. And and we that that's um, you've got to you've got to be able to balance that. I think. So Anne, here's a question: What professional learning resources help you to keep up to date on best practices in performance consulting? ISPI. Oh yeah, I would say ISPI, and I'm sure Steve is a, a huge um, advocate and proponent for ISPI. I mean, there's and ISCI has a number of, um, you know, uh, online resources and such. If you if you're a member, you have access to a lot more than if you're not a member. So, um, I would also say um, ASTD, yep. American Society for Training and Development, is a is a good organization to to be a part of as well. And you know, they have just changed their name. They are now the American the, the American Talent Development. Really? Yes, it's I ATD. American or no Association for Talent Development. Okay. Excuse me. So their their title is different. I mean, my sense is in, they're in transition of their branding. So you'll yeah. see both. Okay. Um, so we are right up at yeah, we look, did, um, one o'clock for you, two o'clock for us. So I, I want to be very respectful of people's time. I'm willing to um, stay on a little longer and answer any more questions, but I'm going to turn it back over to Steve at this point. I think. We're not getting any more questions, so I'd like to ask everyone to click a little red flag to applaud for our presenters. And <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Uh, oh, thank, you. thank you so much for making uh, time to be with us today and sharing your expertise. And You're welcome. We'll be taking the recording and posting it on our OPAL website soon, and I'll let you know when that happens. All right. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Everyone, yep. this concludes our webinar. Thank you for participating.